The king accepted the suggestion, and a magnificent hunt was proclaimed. Horsemen rode out splendidly, got up, Persian nobles, and the pick of the army generally. Even one of them was a sight worth seeing, but the most spectacular was the king himself. He was riding a huge, magnificent Nisaean horse, whose trappings, bit, check pieces, frontlet, breastpiece, were all of gold and wearing a cloak of Tyrian purple, woven in Babylon, and his royal hat was dyed the color of the Hassant. He had a golden sword at his waist and carried two spears, and slung about him were a quiver and a bow of the costliest Chinese workmanship. He was an impressive sight in the saddle. It is characteristic of love to indulge in display. He wanted Kalarho to see him surrounded by people on his way out throughout the entire city. He kept looking around to see whether she was perhaps watching the procession. Soon the mountains were full of people shouting and running, dogs barking, horses neighing, game fleeing. The excitement and the noise they were making would have driven Love himself out of his senses. Delight was mixed with anguish joy with fear, danger with enjoyment. But the king saw no horse, though so many horses were galloping alongside him. No animal, though so many were being pursued. He heard no dog, and when so many were barking. No man, though all were shouting. All he could see was Kalarho, who was not there. He could hear her, though she was not speaking. For love had come out to hunt with him. He is a god who will have his own way. And when he saw someone opposing him with carefully planned resistance, as he thought, he turned his own devices against him, using the remedy itself to inflame his heart. Love entered the king's thoughts, whispering to him how wonderful it would be to see Kalarho here, her tunic tucked up to her knees, her arms bared, face flushed, breast heaving, a very Artemis the archer as she moves on the mountain, high Tejetus or Rhymanthus, delighting in boars and swift deer. Painting this scene in his imagination, the king burned with passion, and when he said this, Artaxates replied, Sir, you are forgetting what has happened. Kalarho has no husband. The decision remains to be made as to whom she should marry. So remember that you are in love with a woman who has lost her husband. That means you need not be afraid of breaking the law. The law applies to married people or of committing adultery because first there has to be a husband who would be the injured party. Only then can there be an adulterer to commit the injury. The king approved this argument because it tended to his pleasure. He put his arm around the eunuch and embraced him. I am right to hold you in esteem beyond all others, he said. You are the most well disposed to me. You protect me well. Go then and bring Kalarho, but with two injunctions. Do not bring her against her will and do not bring her openly. I want you to win her consent and I do not want anyone to know about it. So at once agreed, the agreed signal was given for recalling the hunt, and everyone turned back. The king's hopes were exalted, and he rode into the palace in high spirits, as if he had caught the finest game. Artaxates was high in high spirits too. He thought that he had undertaken a valuable service, and would be holding the reins at court from now on, since both would be grateful to him, especially, especially Kalarho. He judged that it would be an easy matter to handle. He was thinking like a eunuch, a slave, a barbarian. He did not know the spirit of a well-born Greek, especially Kalarho, chaste Kalarho, who so loved her husband. Well, he waited for the chance to approach her when she was by herself. I have brought you a wealth of great benefits, lady, he said. 
do remember my services to you. I am sure you have a grateful nature. At first words, Callerho's heart filled with joy. Human beings are continued, are constituted to believe what they want to happen. So she thought she was about to be restored to Charius. She was eager to hear that and readily promised to reward the eunuch for his good news. He began with a preliminary opening. Lady, he said, you have been blessed with divine beauty, but you have not gained any great benefit or distinction from it. Your name is known and famous all over the world, but up till now, it has not got you a husband or lover worthy of you. It has lit on two men, one a poor islander, the other a slave of the king. What great or glorious benefit has come to you from them? What fertile land do you own? What costly jewels? What city do you rule over? How many slaves bow down before you? Women in Babylon have servants who are wealthier than you, but you have not been completely forgotten. The gods are looking after you, and that is why they have brought you here, ostensibly for the trial, so that the great king may see you. And this is your first piece of good news. It has given the king pleasure to see you. I remind him of this, too. I speak well of you to him. This, of course, was his own addition. Any slave, when he is talking to someone about his master, will bring himself into the story in the hope of profiting personally from the conversation. Our Taxites' words struck at the gods continue, struck at Kalerho's heart like a sword. She pretended not to understand. May the gods continue gracious, continue gracious to the king, she said, and he to you for taking pity on an unfortunate woman. Let him release all me all the sooner from my worry, I beg, by deciding the issue, so that I may no longer be a burden to the queen either. The eunuch thought that he had not made his meaning plain, and that Kalerho had not understood, and now he spoke more clearly. This is just where you are lucky, he said. It is not slaves and poor men who are your lovers now but the great king, who can give Miletus itself to you as a present, and the whole of Ionia and Sicily, and other nations greater than those. So make sacrifice to the gods and count yourself happy. Try to please him still more, and when you are rich, remember me. Calerho's first impulse was to dig her nails into the eyes of this would-be pimp and tear them out if she could. But being a well-brought-up and sensible woman, she quickly remembered where she was, who she was, and who it was who was talking to her. She controlled her anger, and from that point spoke hypocritically to the barbarian. Oh, she said, I hope I am not so deranged as to let myself believe I am fit for the great king. I am like the servants of Persian women, I beg you, Please do not talk about me to your master any more. You can be sure that even if he is not angry with you straight away, he will be later on, when he realizes that you have thrown the ruler of the whole world to Dionysius' slave girl. I am surprised that with all your intelligence, you fail to recognize how humane the king is. He is not in love with an unfortunate woman. He is taking pity on her. We had better stop this talking someone may misrepresent us to the queen. With that, she hurried off, leaving the eunuch standing there all agape. He had been brought up in a highly despotic society and could not conceive there was anything impossible, even for himself, let alone the king.